Hello, I'm Lucy Wright. I'm Juliet Maxim, and welcome back to Life on Rails. We both work in PR at Greater Anglia, and in this podcast, we want to take you behind the curtain at one of the UK's biggest train companies. We're talking to all kinds of staff at Greater Anglia, those who work in stations, depots and on trains, head office support staff, and some of the biggest names in the train world or local celebrities. And in this winter episode, we speak to Julie Berry, one of the voices for Greater Anglia's announcements. Say you're coming out of London, Victoria, you might go through places like Pulborough, Billingshurst, Horsham, there's more to come, you hear that inflection, and then Portsmouth and Portsmouth Harbour. Accessibility Manager, Rebecca Richardson. I've brought in professionals in equality training, communications professionals to help create an accessible comm strategy. That's probably the most satisfying part of my job is to give a voice to disabled people. Our resident fairs guru, Ken Strong. The London night out is when you're actually going out for the whole night and coming back the following morning, either staying in a hotel or just going to a club and spending the whole night in a club and doing what you do during the night, as people do. And Martin Beeble talking about the green features on our new trains. We've got a fleet of new bi-mode trains. They're called bi-modes because they can use two types of power, so diesel and electric. When the trains run onto areas of the network where there's overhead wires, the trains can use the electric systems on board, which are really green. To kick things off though, we're going to speak to Jason Brandon, our brand manager in charge of our trains designs. Jason, how are you? Thanks very much for coming on. Thank you. I'm very good. Very good. How did you decide what colour the new trains were going to be and what they would look like inside? Yeah, it's it's a good question. It is a blank canvas to some degree, but there are certain factors which kind of push you in, in certain directions. So first and foremost is the brand, the, the brand colour palette, and that is set. But then you have to develop those colours. You can't just use the, the, the exact same red, the exact same grey, exact same blacks and whites. You, you have to flex them to work on different materials, and that takes an awful lot of testing and lots of samples flooding both my house and my office. I've I've got a crazy cupboard full of samples upstairs. You want to make it a comfortable environment. Our brand colours are contemporary, but they're not necessarily what I'd call comfortable colours. They're they're quite cold and, and harsh, so you want to add in different textures, lots of different gradients, you know, whether that be a wood grain that we introduced or metallic looks. You know, they, they all they all add and kind of have to blend together. I'm interested. How much does your house look like the inside of our lovely new trains? I'll be honest. Yes, there is a lot of grey in my house and I use wood grains to break up that grey. So, yes, there is definitely an element of my taste in there. But then I think my main objective was to, to ensure that it, it, it was comfortable for as many people as possible. I've got to ask you, why carpet? Our new trains have got carpet, which I personally really like, but other people might think is slightly impractical. There's two things really. I mean, one is, and and you've said you like it yourself, and that is because there is a slightly more luxurious feel about carpet. It makes you feel like you're on a higher class service. On our class 720 Alston built trains, the underfloor heating requires a very specific type of flooring, not too thick of a carpet so that the heating can't get through, but then also not too thin a lino so that too much gets through and we end up kind of melting the glue on the lino. So there's a very specific fabric called Forbo, which is kind of a halfway house between those two, while it's also easy to clean. We're sat on the seats that we took out to our road shows. Now, I really like these seats. I love the lumbar support. I find them really comfortable. But can you tell me a little bit about how you chose the design for these Yes, yeah, so, so when, we, when we're looking at the seats, there's, there's lots of different elements that we wanted to incorporate. Our intercity trains have always had quite popular seats, but one of the things that used to catch people out was the armrests, and, and they used to have to slide over laps a bit uncomfortably at times, whereas this was the, the, the up and down seat armrest was very important to make sure we had that. One of the key features is sometimes you sit in the seat and you think that's it, but you have to think about the seat in front of you as well. Textures as well, so... We, we've we, we selected a cut and cut maquette, which is well, I can hear my hand rubbing on it now because it's got a bit of give to it, which which actually adds an extra level of comfort as well. I've always been a fan of, of leather in the correct use. When you have a seat that's all leather, sometimes you, you end up sliding off a bit. Whereas we, we've opted just for the headrests, um, so we've got a slightly different 
headrest texture to the rest of the seat, which, which adds extra sort of luxury as well. We've actually got the, the leather all the way through the train, so we've, we've really kind of upped our standards throughout the train. And we also wanted to make sure that we had seat back tables as well. That's that special S shape. Yeah, that, that S shape is not only good for the person behind you, but also that is kind of vital for your lumbar support and good posture on the journey. What about the foam? Because some people like seem to think that we can put in their settee type comfort on a train seat, but there are other things to consider, aren't there? There are, yeah. There's lots of legislations, rigorous fire and smoke testing. The entire, the entire carriage goes for a fire and smoke test. So the more foam you have in a seat, the more smoke is, is emitted. Unfortunately, it, it's that that kind of triggers those those tests and fails the seats. So we do have to reduce the amount of foam that's in the seat so that we can pass those tests. But yeah, we, we tried to make up for that in the fabric choices and also, more importantly, the shape of the seat. And we do get an awful lot of feedback from customers saying how comfortable the seats are. Yeah, I think we get lots of good feedback on that. We're now going behind the scenes with Rebecca Richardson, our accessibility manager. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for coming on our podcast. Thanks for inviting me. Can you just tell me a bit about your role, please? What it is that you do? Yeah. So like you said, I'm the accessibility manager and essentially I'm the gatekeeper of our accessibility policy, which is our commitment to how we support customers with access requirements. That means I get involved in every area of the business. I mean, I work across all the different departments, all the different teams. We look at policies, projects, explore where customers might encounter barriers when they travel and try and unpick that and work to remove them. So it could be working on rail replacement policy one day or writing training programmes for colleagues the next, or maybe supporting the fleet team with new train design, that sort of thing. It's a really, really important role. And like you said, it encompasses every aspect of the business. And a lot's changed over the past couple of years, hasn't it? We've obviously got our new trains. So can you just talk me through what accessibility features we have on the new trains? Yeah, sure. So the accessibility of trains is a regulatory standard and trains are designed according to that. This includes a lot of technical details such as lighting, information screens, things like colour contrast, size of the wheelchair space, for instance, and even how many wheelchair spaces a train has to have. And the new trains have been running now for a couple of years. So what kind of feedback? have you had from our disabled customers? The feedback we've had from customers has been really good actually and there's a lot about these trains that make them significantly better than what we were running before but from an accessibility point of view there's no denying that the level boarding that we've now got at the majority of the stations that these trains call at is completely transformative for how people can access rail services more independently and so yeah it's been really nice to have that feedback. How can customers arrange a system? when travelling? There are lots of different ways but I would probably suggest people consult our website and on the front page of our website there is a button for accessibility and it will take you through to the pages where there's lots and lots of information about assisted travel and our accessible travel policy and how people can find support for their journey. So I, I would suggest customers go on the website first and there's lots of different ways that they can get in touch with us. What's your ultimate goal for making travel accessible? What are you hoping to do in the future? Well, I think there's probably an awful lot still to do. So we've made some really good progress over the last few years, tackling some of those barriers that people face when they travel. But there is an awful lot still to be done, both within Greater Anglia and actually the wider industry. Making rail accessible is more than just altering the sort of physical infrastructure of a station. It's ensuring that everything that we do from how we manage customer information, how we maintain facilities such as lifts and toilets, how we source our rail replacement, for instance, is how we do that with an inclusive mindset and in a way that makes it accessible for as many people as possible. You really have achieved so much in your role. What is it that you're most proud of? But I think ultimately the thing that I have taken the most satisfaction from, I suppose, is how I've been able to personally amplify the voices of disabled people within the business in a really meaningful and professional and respectful way. So I've brought in professionals in equality training to support our training programme, communications professionals to help create an accessible comm strategy, 
And another project that I worked on in the same sort of vein during lockdown, and you may remember, Lucy, I worked with a a disability equality expert to build some webinars for colleagues. We spoke to lots of disabled people about their experiences of travelling by rail. That was really good and it helped us with our training programme for colleagues. That's probably the most satisfying part of my job is to to give a voice to disabled people. I do remember the training. I thought the training was really good. It was so helpful and there are tangible things which I changed in the way that I work as a result of the training and the work that I do on a lot of our social channels. Thank you so much for coming on our podcast. Thank you so much for all the hard work that you do. Thank you. Now it's time for seasonal myth busters and in this episode I'm quizzing Juliet on cold weather. We're very much in the winter months now and today we're going to talk about what winter weather means for the railway. So Juliet, how do our new trains cope with snow and ice and what do we do to prepare for this kind of weather? We have got some great tech on board. Did you know we've got snow brakes and they kick in automatically in the right conditions. So the brakes come on like dominoes down the train, one set of wheels after the other, putting heat into the brakes and keeping them clear of snow and ice. And we've also got these things called heated couplers. You join two trains together and those are with couplers and it stops the couplers from getting frozen so you don't have delays because you can't join the trains together. Just quite amazing. But we've got some other really low tech things as well. We've got snow socks for horns. These are on our old trains because if the horns fill up with snow, the horn doesn't work. If the horn doesn't work, the train has to go at 20 miles an hour and nobody wants their train just crawling along, do they? So we've got these special socks to keep the snow from going into the horns. And the new trains, I mean, they are incredible. They've been put through their paces in something called climatic testing, which is they're put into this horribly cold chamber. You would hate it, Lucy. Iced up, snows up, and it makes sure that the train functions properly in bad weather. But customers can be toasty on board because we've got modern heating systems on all of our new trains to keep everybody nice and warm. And how does Greater Anglia prepare for the cold weather? Preparation is absolutely key. We've spent the last few months drawing up plans for every kind of weather. Winter, the biggest problem, snow, ice and then a bit of wind can create blizzard conditions. So we've got plans for our customer service staff, our train drivers, our control, so that when the bad weather strikes, we know what we're doing. We keep a really close eye on the weather all year round and we have detailed 24-hour forecasts and then two to five day weather outlooks and working very closely with Network Rail who run the tracks, the overhead lines, the points, the signals, all of that sort of thing. When the temperatures do plummet, and let's hope that it doesn't get too cold this year, there's lots of stuff that we do. We can treat our new trains with this stuff called pre-frost, and it's like a sticky, gloopy gel that has a much lower freezing temperature than water, and we stick it onto the underside of our train so that when the trains are rushing along between, say, Norwich and London, they don't get frozen up with ice and snow. I really like the thermal warning signs that we have in stations, which change colour when and it's icy because let's face it you can't always see ice it's a bit like black ice and the last thing you want to do is go skidding along the platform as you said network rail they have responsibility for track and infrastructure whereas our responsibility focuses more on the actual running of the trains and the managing of the station so what does network rail do to prepare for snow and ice oh wow network rail have some really cool bits of kit remember the snow plow oh the snow plow in beasts from the east <laughs> videos of a snowplow just went viral. They are incredible. They go along the track and they just blast all of the snow out of the way, making an amazing sound as they do it. But did you know they've also got a train called an Ice Maiden? And that's for knocking all of the icicles off tunnels and equipment. And in fact, as well as the Ice Maiden, they have icicle patrols. (laughs) And so these, these network rail engineers and workers go around the system making sure there aren't any icicles clearing all the points and the points actually have heaters as well to keep them warm so that they don't freeze up because if the points freeze up the trains go in the wrong direction you mentioned there the snow plow and the long icicles we've had those in Ipswich tunnel i remember it really well so we'll put a link to some of these pictures and videos in the show notes are there any misconceptions about snow and ice on the railways that you'd like to correct I'd just like to remind people that our railway is built for our weather. 
we're not Germany, we're not Canada, we're not used to extreme temperatures. We have a bit of snow and ice, maybe for one week a year. If we're lucky, we don't get any at all in East Anglia. Just as schools close, roads clog up with congestion. Remember a few years back when everybody was abandoning their cars on the M11? The railway has to take precautions as well. But the thing that we can guarantee is that we will always let you know of any changes to the service as a result of the weather. And just keep an eye on our website, keep an eye on our social media. We'll let you know. Always, always check before you travel. That's our advice at all times of year, but especially in the winter. Brilliant. Well, let's hope this winter is kind to us and not too harsh. Thank you so much, Juliet. And I look forward to speaking to you in the spring, where we will be back to talk about April showers, flooding and all types of challenges that are associated with spring weather. It's time now for Greener Anglia. And joining us is Martin Beeble, Engineering Director at Greater Anglia. Hi, how are you? Hi, Juliet. I'm very good, thanks. How are you? Oh, fine, thanks. Really good to have you as a guest. So can you just tell me a little bit about your role, please? Yeah, of course. I'm Engineering Director, so I'm responsible for providing trains to the network, the the right amount of them, safe, reliable, every day, so that our passengers can get to and from where they want to go. And I'm also, excitingly, responsible for buying the new trains that are rolling out across the the route at the moment, which is a lot of fun and keeps me entertained, keeps me off the streets, and it's a really good job. I I really enjoy it. Well, pretty broad role Absolutely. And very important, very important. We're here today to talk about our green features on our trains, and our trains have some amazing green features. But I'm just interested, which do you think are the coolest? As a man nearing 40, I'm not sure I'm in a brilliant position to be the judge of what's cool, but I'll give it a go. We've got a fleet of new bi-mode trains. Now, those of you that have been travelling on our network around Norfolk and Suffolk especially will have seen these. They're called bi-modes because they can use two types of power, so diesel and electric. The electric can be drawn from the, the overhead lines. So the diesel engines they've got are, are built to modern standards, which really limits the, the environmental impact of them. And then when the trains run onto areas of the network where there's overhead wires, the trains can use the electric systems on board, which are, which are really green, right, as efficient as you can get. So effectively, our drivers can make sure that they're always selecting the, the most appropriate type of power to use and can go for the, the greenest. They're actually they're the only rural trains like it in the entire country at the moment, which is something I think we should be proud of. Oh, Absolutely, that's incredible. It really is. They've they've also got the capability to fit batteries later in life. So if if say for example battery technology gets better, I know that lots of people will think, well, batteries batteries are great now, aren't they? You know, I see the Teslas driving up and down the street every day, and batteries are, are, are good and getting better. But when we're talking about moving trains that are potentially hundreds of tons, you just don't have the, the right level of what we'd call energy density in a battery. In other words, you need a massive battery to keep a train like ours running all day. But in the future, we expect batteries to get smaller and a bit better. And therefore, we hope to be able to replace the engines on some of our trains in the future with, uh, with batteries, which will help them become even more greener. But we've also got some fantastic stuff on these new trains, yet, like regen brakes where we've got trains that are being powered by overhead line electricity the trains normally have well the trains do have electric motors which they use to power the wheels so the power comes in from the overhead lines through a transformer and then we use it to power the power the motors so when we're braking we stop powering those wheels and those motors effectively turn into generators so they generate electricity so the momentum that the train has got The train uses that momentum effectively to generate electricity and put it back into the overhead lines. Now, that means that the trains that are coming up the network behind it can use that electricity. And if you're using a traditional old diesel train or an old electric train, you won't have that capability. So, I mean, it, it really is pretty incredible and a really efficient way to operate a train and to travel. And so all of our new trains have got that capability, which I think is fantastic. Gosh, these are just such incredible energy saving features. Is, is there anything else on your cool list? Well, we're getting it's a little bit less cool, I think, but they're actually designed to be a lot lighter as well. Now, like I say, it's not a, a really snazzy feature, but it's a really simple, important, basic feature, which helps to limit the amount of electricity we have to use, the amount of power we have to use to move the trains around. Because, of course, if they're lighter, it takes less, less effort to move them around. And we've done that 
with the manufacturers through a, a, a range of different ways. But primarily, a lot of our old trains were made out of steel. Um, the new ones are made out of aluminium. Oh, just brilliant. So how much does thinking about the environment and measures to combat climate change come into the decisions that you're making every day? Has it changed the way that engineering in the railway is done? Absolutely. So if you were to, to pull out a copy of the specification that we wrote for these trains, energy saving and reducing the carbon footprint of the trains was was written through it like a stick of rock. You would see that the trains were designed so that they could be easily recycled at end of life, just for, for instance. They were designed to try and be as energy efficient as they can be. They were designed to reuse energy, as we've, as we've already talked about, when it's at all possible. But also, it's not just the sort of designing of trains, it's how we, how we use them as well. So we're always looking to minimise the amount of movement of empty trains around the network, so to get them into the right place for, for the next day, we try and reduce that, all the way through to making sure we're managing our waste and trying to recycle at the depots as well. It's, it's a really core part of, of what we do and who we are. And we know that it's really important to our passengers and it's getting even more important to the UK public and to the world as a whole. So we need to play our part in making sure we're focusing on, on our environment and sustainability as well. That's brilliant. And of course, we play our part and it means that people choosing to go by train are reducing their carbon footprint more and more as we make improvements and we cut our own carbon footprint. Absolutely. We're joined now by Ken Strong, Greater Anglia's resident fares guru. Ken, welcome back. Thank you for having me back. Back in October, we heard from you about the benefits of advanced tickets. Christmas is coming up fast now, and I just wanted to speak to you about how our group save and London evening out and London night out tickets can help people with their holiday plans. So when travelling in groups, is it cheaper for people to buy tickets separately or together? We have a very good offer where people travelling in groups of between three and nine people can buy tickets together and save a third on each ticket. So that's obviously worth doing. And how can people do that? How is there an option when people go to book their ticket? If you're booking online and you go to the rail card options, there is one of the options is for a group save, as the offer is known. And you just put in one lot of group save and then you get the discount on your group. Once you've selected the number of passengers, obviously it won't let you do it if you don't put in that you're three or more people. So no need to buy a rail card or anything like that. Just pop in that there's more than three of you travelling and you can get group save. Easy as pie. You can buy it from the ticket office. You can buy it online. You can buy it on the app. Easy as pie. Just specify how many people are travelling and select the group save discount. And another useful tip, if you're travelling, if it's two adults and one child, you can make the child an honorary adult just select three adults and then you only pay for the two adults and the child in effect is free. So that's a useful little tip as well. That's a great tip. And it's Christmas shopping season. People are now enjoying mini breaks after having limited travel options during the pandemic. So can you just tell me a bit about the London overnight ticket and the London evening out as well, please? We have a couple of offers for the London evening out and the London night out, which are available on quite a lot of our long distance routes into London from Norfolk and Suffolk and North Essex and Cambridgeshire. The London evening out ticket is, as it suggests, going for an evening out in London. So you book a specific train to go out and then the return is flexible and you can go back any time that evening. The first train you can book out is around about 1400, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Obviously it varies from where, depending where you're coming from. And then you can come back on any train apart from in the main high rush hour, you know, between sort of 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock. But any time other than that, you can come back. So you can go to London, have a meal, see a show, have a few drinks, whatever you want to do and come back that same evening and it's cheaper than buying an ordinary day return. The London night out, also as the name suggests, is when you're actually going out for the whole night and coming back the following morning, either staying in a hotel or just going to a club and spending the whole night in a club and doing what you do (laughs) during the night as people do. And that one you can come back any time the following morning from 8.30 onwards until midday on a weekday and any time at weekends up till 12 o'clock. And again, it's any time after roughly 2 p.m. to go into London on the afternoon of the first day. That sounds brilliant. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. Up next is Travel Surgery, where Lucy and I sit down with a special guest to pick the perfect destination on our network for them. And today we're joined by voiceover artist Julie Berry. Her voice is heard across the country, including on our trains. 
as well as doing announcements for Greater Anglia, Julie is the voice of the Piccadilly line and for all train lines over southern England. And she's also worked for brands such as British Airways, CNN, Sainsbury's and Marks and Spencer. Hers is definitely a voice you'll recognise. Hello, Julie. How are you? Hello there. I'm very well indeed, thank you. To kick it off, I wondered if you could describe your role for us, for someone who's never heard of voice acting. Well, voice acting encompasses all sorts of things because you might be the disembodied voice on a television advert or on a radio advert or you might be the narrator on a documentary or you could be doing a corporate narrative but basically it's when just the voice is involved nobody needed (laughs) and how does voice recording work do you spend the whole day in the studio um listing off greater anglia station names how how does it work It's largely put together by a supercomputer. So you'll take a short phrase, for example, change here, and that will be put together by the computer with something like for stations to wherever. So you've got all those sort of little bits, you know, the front four coaches are for somewhere, and it'll list list a load of things. The rear four coaches are for wherever. This service is for... It will be a phrase and then all the stations get recorded separately in different inflections, depending on where they are on the line. For example, say you're coming out of London, Victoria, you might go through places like Pulborough, Billingshurst, Horsham. There's more to come. You hear that inflection. And then Portsmouth and Portsmouth Harbour or whatever is at the end of the line. Once upon a time, we used to do three different inflections. When I first started doing this back in the 80s, there would be this station, this station, this station. Then there'd be a penultimate one, this station and this station. So I don't know if you can hear the difference. Yeah, I can. I'm going to listen out for that next time I'm on the train. Judy, do you live on the Piccadilly line? I do. <laughs> I actually do. And that's partly why I did the job. I love this. I know. I know. I hear me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you not mind the sound of your own voice? I mean, I, you know, not only have a trained voice, but I then trained other voices for five years. And you learn your craft. You really learn your craft and what your voice will and won't do. And mostly I've had very, very nice feedback about my about my voice. The only time I didn't was when I was, I did a job for British Telecom at the end of the 80s, which was being the voice model for directory inquiries, the first automated directory inquiries when there was only BT. And I had to do all the Welsh exchange names. But one of the newspapers down in Cardiff or something, when when the, the AVR was rolled out there, some journalists said that I sounded like Margaret Thatcher. (laughs) (gasps) I don't think so. (laughs) No. (laughs) And outside of voice acting, have you got any other creative pursuits that you enjoy? Well, I wrote a book called Ray's Game about a man called Ray Half, which I published under the name of Jules Berry. And that was that's quite fun. Oh, it's just fascinating hearing about your career and how you got into it and all the different things you've done. But we must ask you some questions about what you like to do, because we want to send you somewhere on our network. When you're recording announcements of station names, do you ever think, hmm, I like the sound of that place, I'd like to go there? Oh, yes, there are always places that sound rather exotic. (laughs) And one of them is in Norfolk, Sheringham, I've always thought. Sounds like it must be very beautiful somehow. It's it's certainly a very quaint little coastal town. Gorgeous scenery, clifftop walks. Sounds gorgeous. In your spare time, what type of things do you like to do? What do you like to do for fun? In the country, I love to get out and walk on the downs in in Sussex, if I'm down that way. I love a good hike up a hill. Ah, well, we've got a lot of countryside in East Anglia. And I think we've got something just perfect for you, actually. You could catch a train to Sheringham. You must go and see it. You've wondered what it's like. You've announced it often enough. You must go and see it for yourself. Uh And then you can walk the coastal path, part of the Norfolk coastal path, to Cromer, Uh which is another quaint seaside town, wonderful fish and chips, Cromer crabs. If you go in the summer, there's even goats on the hills. Wonderful. And it's just a four and a half mile walk. So not too taxing, but wonderful views over the North Sea, which really does look blue on a beautiful sunny day. So yeah, let's send you a ticket to Sheringham and we'll send you details of the walk. That sounds absolutely wonderful. I would love that. Thank you. That's it from us for this episode. We hope you've enjoyed listening and exploring more of what makes Greater Anglia tick. 
If you've enjoyed this episode, please do leave us a rating or review on your podcast platform and tweet us at Greater Anglia PR. Life on Rails releases quarterly, so be sure to check back next time for episode three. In the meantime, though, follow or subscribe to the podcast for free so you never miss an episode and visit our website at www.greateranglia.co.uk forward slash podcast for more information. Thanks for joining us. Bye.